is Yenping Shen, and we're going to talk about a different journey now. Rather than a journey how computer science leads to a completely different field, we're going to talk about the field of entrepreneurship, about the lessons learned from computer science and how these have been applied in a, in a range of company formations and things that have gone on uh, since leaving. So, you know, it's very interesting how computer science, in fact, <laughs> equips you for a wide range of, uh, of, of other experiences beyond those that we imagine when we're teaching classes. Uh, you go ahead and get that there, and Would you put I'll get the lapel mic, or would you put there the stick mic? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and put the mic in up. So, I remember um, in Mary's talk, she uh, mentioned this Dewey exam. I wonder how many of you were subjected to the Dewey. I was actually w among the last students who took the Dewey, but I am now the exam chair. And this is something that students, you know, uh, the thing you can always count on graduate students for is uh, optimizing and figuring out. So our, our, as soon as we come up with an exam, a new way of doing it, they figure out a way to work around it. And she was in the advent. I remember the Dewey, by the time it got to me, students were almost taking semesters off to practice to study and work on the degree. And then we replaced it with a different exam, which has hence been replaced with a different exam. So, com you know, the, the nice thing like you no find out about, com about computer science majors is they're the ultimate optimizers. They figure out uh, any, any set of obstacles given to them and they reverse the, uh, they figure out the best way to optimize for it. And so that's been going on for generations, as we can see in, in Mary's talk. I can start talking. Okay, well, we can we'll go ahead. Yeah. I'll, I mean, I, it won't cut into your time. I'll That's okay. Uh, 20 minutes of your time. I'm just going to switch this way. Well, while he's uh, working on the, um, the, the presentation, um, let me uh, mention a couple of things. First is that uh, this was uh, developed as a one-hour presentation, so I'm going to shrink it down to half an hour. I'm going to skip a bunch of contents. If you find anything interesting um, that I skip, feel free to stop, me, uh, stop by afterward, and uh, I'll be happy to talk about it. Second, uh, secondly, I want to give you a little bit of uh, my background. I'm now coming from academia. Um, for most of my, uh, and, and the background will help you understand where my observation came from. Um, for most of my career, I've been working on large-scale mission-critical software systems. And what I mean by large-scale is that um, uh, not only there's a lot of code, a million here, a million there, you know, it all adds up. Uh, it's also that uh, uh, the system touches a lot of people. For example, the payroll system that I work on at ADP, um, about 15 years ago, it was paying one out of eight American workers. And if I look back on the back end, we wire a lot of money from people's bank account to, uh, um, to their employees. Uh, we wire about uh, 650 billion US dollars a year in our back end. Uh, and even the little uh, dealership management system at Reynolds and Reynolds that I worked on, uh, we had about 50% of North American market share. So if you ever go to a dealership to buy a car or get your car serviced, most likely you're gonna be using my system. And if you buy multiple cars, you definitely will run into my system. And what I mean by mission critical is that when the software fails, it's really painful. For example, people don't get paid. And just can you imagine one out of eight Americans don't get paid? Yeah, that would be a really a fun day for Wall Street, right? Um, so um, with that, um, what I'm going to um, tell you is what I learned through the 30 years that I wish the people who I hired knew when I hired them. And I wish I learned myself, I already knew known when I got out of school. Um, I want to thank a lot of people. Uh, there are two of them sitting in a back seat. Um, one is Dr. Brooks, and the other one is uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, first is that Dr. Smith is my dissertation advisor, who got me interested in not just the computation part of computer science, but also the other part. I was forced to take cognitive psychology. At that time, I didn't understand why. But then later on in my career, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I, will, I realized that there's a lot of usefulness in what I learned. I had an opportunity to think about all this. Uh, several years ago, um, when my mom was fighting lung cancer, she was stage four. For the last month of her life, I stayed with her 
in a palliative care center in a hospital. Late at night, and several of her roommates passed. Late at night, I got a lot of time to think about things. Things that I usually don't think about. For example, what is success? Is success fame, power, number of people working for you, or lasting contributions? Or what, I'm, what am I doing? Why am I doing certain, you know, what I'm doing right now? I realize that most of us, we don't think about the meta questions. We just do things. We were trained to study hard, get a degree, work hard, make money. But why? Um, I, I still remember vividly about 15 years into my marriage with my wife. She's a very smart lady, okay? Uh, you know why. We were in an argument, big fight, and I was winning it. <laughs> it was really nailing her on logic. <laughs> then she said, really kind of with a soft, no, a soft, soft voice, she said, okay, so you graduated first in class in your high school, went to the best college, you got your PhD in computer science. You got a great job, a big title, big deal. Guess who's making all the money? Who's spending it? <laughs> <laughs> then I realized that, hey, your lifestyle really has very little to do with how much you make. It really has to do with how much you spend. So it's this kind of a things that I, I gradually picked up and it's on my own discovery that I'm gonna share with you, and yours will be different, and I encourage you to do your own discovery too. First thing I realized out of school, the big difference is that in school, we study the same book, we have the same assignment, we take the same test. Why? It's necessary for the efficiency of teaching and grading, right? And during graduate school years, students start to diverge in their activities. But when you get out of uh, the school in the, in the workplace, in industry, how many of us who are still working on what our uh, you know, dissertation topic, uh, we have a good example, right, or, or your master's thesis topic? Not very, not very many of us. And if you are working today and you look at your coworkers, how many of your coworkers are working on exactly the same thing? Pretty much zero, okay. So what I realized is that we learn two things in, in school. One is knowledge. The other one is how to get things done. And we use both of them to serve the shareholder, or to, to serve the stakeholder. And what are your stakeholder is for you to find out, and I'll give you a couple of examples. What I learned is that knowledge may fade, but how to get things done will stay with you and you're gonna be benefiting from it. So when you go out, you also work in a team. And most successful projects, they usually are long running and uh, involve many people. I'll give you a couple of, uh, few examples. The windows everybody knows. Uh, the auto pay is the payroll system that I work on. 18 million lines of code. Even that tiny little, little dealership management system has 5.5 million lines of code. That does not include the system that I bought to augment it around it, okay? So, uh, and all of them are long running projects, 10 years, 20 years, some of them even 30 years. And because you're successful, you got a lot of users. They pay you money and so you make more money. And then there's more re requirements for you to enhance it and then you hire more people to develop it. That loop just continue. So it's go round and round and round. So in essence, we almost never develop in anything from scratch, not like in, in school. And even if you're a long developer today, you want to develop a little cell phone app, you, st you still have to deal with a lot of people who certify you and the app store people and, and all that. So you always work in a team. And working a team means that you're working with people. Before you can be a good leader, you want to be a good follower. I'm going to skip a couple of points here. And the, the one of the key characteristics of a good follower is to be dependable. And what do you do? You want to know if you're on a critical path. Um, tell people you're behind as soon as possible and build in slacks. After all, when is the last time we saw any software project that came in ahead of schedule, right? And also this thing I pick up from Dr. Brooks, 
there's no hero on the sinking ship. It's very true, especially in the industry. You can see the entire team getting laid off because of a project fail. It doesn't matter how well you're doing individually. And the most important people skill, if you're working in a team, is your communication skill. One thing that I learned is that you gotta get uh, the point across, you need to know how to, the preferred communication mode of your target. There are a lot of people who are very textual, so you can email, text message, but there are a certain percentage of the population that are very verbal. So to convince them, you have to talk to them even, on, uh, even if it's just on the phone. Otherwise, they will not agree with you. Okay. I'm gonna skip over this, and, uh, but I would like to encourage you to look at presentation. Um, uh, a good example would be uh, on YouTube. You do a search on YouTube, United Breaks Guitar, and see how the author of that presentation tells the story. It is a wonderful um, presentation. I'm not gonna uh, go through the detail, as I mentioned, I don't have the time. Um, but in any presentation, you also wanna expect the unexpected and be quick on your feet. Let me give you a story. This was when I was the chairman of Reynolds and Reynolds China. We were on a, a, on a country-wide tour to find a location for our support and R&D center in China. So we went through the uh, usual suspect, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Nanjing, and Chengdu, and Xi'an was the last city. This was supposed to be a um, routine meeting, greet meeting, with the official uh, who's in charge of their high-tech industry. Except something was wrong that day. Okay. Um, first sign is that the conference room is unusually large. And uh, there's a lot of reporters there, including a TV station. <laughs> now, the typical setup of a, of a conference room in China is that uh, it's U-shape. That's, that's the door, and you have the, uh, the leader of the, uh, the visiting team sitting over here facing the door, and then the host face the door too, and your entourage would sit facing each other on the side in packing orders. So second thing that I realized it was that something that was different is that the official who's re relatively senior, who, I, who I'm supposed to meet, is sitting way down at the end, right? Sure enough, the city party secretary walked in. All right, in case you're not familiar uh, with the, uh, um, the, the Chinese political system, the mayor reports to the city party secretary. So she's the number one, All right? And, uh, and, and Xi'an, the city, it's not the biggest city, but it is uh, an important city. They have the uh, Terracotta Warriors there, and it has about uh, eight, nine million people. So it's about the size of New York City. So this is the, this is the leader of that city, he walked in. And it went downhill from there. As soon as he started talking, I realized that he's not a typical communist bureaucrat. He actually is very knowledgeable. Instead of talking about uh, the Communist Party, what they have done for the people, he talks about the aviation and space history developed in Xi'an, and also the uh, education system that emphasizes the, uh, the, the math and science. And later I found out he's got a PhD in economics. All right. So all the statements, different versions, because I, I was prepared, different versions of statements that my Chinese staff prepared for me, they were all woefully inappropriate. All right. So what am I gonna do? I certainly don't wanna make a fool of myself or my company, not in front of a TV, right? So first order of business is to buy time. I looked down my side of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the conference room, I realized my purchasing VP, he's a Caucasian. He completely does not understand Chinese. <laughs> so what I did is uh, on the fly, I switch over, I start talking in English instead of addressing everybody in Chinese. And that requires the interpreter to interpret every sentence that I utter. So that bought me some time. <laughs> then I started realizing that, hey, wait a minute. He was talking about Xi'an as an aviation space city. I came from Dayton, Ohio. That's where Wright Brothers are, uh, you, know, you know, built their airplane, right? So I started talking about the history of Dayton and also the, the big R&D center we have, U.S. Air Force has in Dayton, and that, uh, that, that's a good omen 
for our success of a collaboration, it turns out that it worked out pretty well. We got invited uh, to have dinner with this guy, and then later on they gave us the most preferential treatment of all the businesses. So we invested only like a one, uh, one, one, one hundredth of what, what uh, Intel invested in that city, and we got the same deal. Okay. I'm going to skip these. Networking, it is true that 70% of jobs are found through networking. And your network can help you much more than just finding a job. How do you network? Very easy. Keep a genuine interest in other people and try to help them whenever you can. Some, some would ask me, what's in it for me, right? Why do I want to help whenever I can? Well. The thing is that you never know when your network is going to come in handy. Second thing is that I always feel good doing it. Okay. And to, for many of the engineers, we're kind of introvert. To overcome the inertia, we have to realize that. First is that there is a choice between playing video games or watching TV or get off your butt and go you know, mingle with people. Um, secondly, if you don't have anything to say, ask other people their interest. Most likely they're going to open up. And uh, the, key, the other key is to keep up with the network you already have. And schoolmates are the precious because they don't have any conflict of interest. They don't have any hidden agenda. That cannot be said about your colleague at work and when you get out of uh, the school. Especially, you want to reach out to your friends when they're not flying high. So when they're, when, when they're successful, yes, congratulate them. But when they're down and out, that's when you reach out to them and try to help them. Negotiation is critical. And many technical people do not know how to do that well. And unfortunately, I don't, I'm going to skip over this one. Uh, let's go to what is, gonna, is a company. A company is a structure to maximize stakeholder value. In the United States, a for-profit company, the stakeholder is the shareholder. Notice that the employees are not mentioned. Okay, this is by law. Okay. Now, if you're in a charitable uh, organization, then uh, those who are receiving your charity are also part of your stakeholder. So you gotta, you gotta be careful you know, to figure it out. Now, for in a, in a company, what are the job levels and titles, really, right? Um, it is the motivation for you to keep working hard for the company. And what is the title? The title does two things for you. First is that it uh, uh, encourages customers to pay attention. Second thing is that it is, it is the cheapest way to make you feel good. <laughs> And let me ask, uh, if, you're, if you're working already, the percentage of your colleagues um, who put their interests ahead of, uh, you know, put, put the company's interests ahead of their own interests? Not many, okay. And that, that's not a bad thing. A good company, and, and this is why uh, uh, capitalism always trump communism. Um, as long as the, the, your personal best interest is aligned with your company interest, there's nothing wrong about it. Actually, many good companies, they align it perfectly, therefore they accomplish a great deal. I'm not going to go into the, the comparison of those two. Uh, and also I, I observed that most jump in pay doesn't come from linear promotion. There are two areas that you can get the most jump. One is change up, the other one is you start something new. It doesn't have to be starting something new in a startup. In a, in a big corporation, you go into a new division, that's when you get the, the risk and, and the reward. And like gambling, you really need, need to know when to fold it. Um, you work more for your boss than a company. So working for a bad boss in a good company is not a good situation. Right? And when do you know what, when you, it's time for you to leave? If you're not working on the right thing, or if you're not appreciated, or if you're not learning anything, it's time for you to move. And know that it's much easier to find a job when you have one. Now, let's flip over. What's, the idea, what's an ideal employee, right? Um, some would say that the, uh, uh, the ideal employee is do as told, doesn't get paid much, never complain, <laughs> never leave, unless you let them go, right? Nah, that'll be slavery, right? So, 
in a, in a knowledgeable, uh, knowledge-based workplace, a good employee uh, it has two characteristics. First one is that it gets the job done ahead of the time on the budget. Uh, second is that it makes the boss look good. Remember, you work for your boss more than your company. And you need to understand the value and your standing of your boss, as well as take initiatives and be accountable. Um, if you look at your classmates over 20 years, 30 years, are the first in class the most successful ones? No, right? And so academic ability is not everything. It's important. Also, luck has a lot to do with it, with it, although you still have to be good, right? So if that's the case, then we should take chances. And I'm going to skip the, over the story. Um, I would like to encourage you, especially when you're young, try new things. Believe me, it's much easier when you don't have a wife, you don't have kids, you don't have a mortgage to try something new. Right? Even if you're um, matured, you still want to try something impossible in your lifetime, just once. Okay. Uh, do people know what Apache is? It's the web server, right? Um, so I'm going to tell you a story about that. Um, this was uh, in the mid-90s. Go-Go years on the internet, and Netscape is the hot company. Except there is a very disturbing trend. They're losing web browser share to Microsoft on the client side, because Microsoft just embed the, the uh, you know, Internet Explorer into the, into the operating system. And there's an even more disturbing trend is that they're losing shares on the server side to Microsoft too. Okay? And we realized that, uh, that this is what the years when I was working with IBM, is that we developed software on top of the, the server platform. And if Microsoft owns both the client platform and the server platform, the game is over. Nobody can compete with them. It's not a level playing field. Okay? So what do we do? Right? At the time, everybody has their own proprietary web server. HP has one, everybody has one, and nobody has any market share. Right? And so we need to find something that's good and that's neutral, so every all the companies can stand behind it to counter Microsoft. Well, yeah, it's easily said and done because the, um, um, we found Apache. But after we found Apache, the problem is that all I need to do is to convince IBM, the, all the executives in IBM, to bet all their internet products on a piece of freeware. And then to go over and convince Apache uh, uh, to trust IBM while they think IBM was a for-profit, slow, big, fat elephant. Right? And then I have 200 programmers in the lab who's, who's created our own web server. All I need to do is just convince them to kill their own baby and shift their focus to, to, to help Apache. And then we have IBM lawyers, right? I want to I wanna convince them to let me throw IBM's credibility, financial resource, reputation, everything behind this, um, beside, behind this freeware so that our corporate customer are comfortable using it. Right? Uh, and I still remember the first conference call with the IBM lawyers, there's six of them, three in the headquarters, three sitting in front of me, and the sweat coming out of their forehead when they asked me, okay, so um, who, should I, uh, who can I license this software from? I said, nobody. And uh, if I, if I want to pay them uh, like, uh, you know, something, where can I send the payment to? They don't have an address. Right. So, that, so many people told me that you're going to fail miserably, and your IBM career is going to go down with it. And I'm, I'm happy that I didn't listen to them, but I, I learned a lot from their, um, they tell me why I'm going to fail. Right? So in the end, we pulled it off. It, 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 we have to overcome so many obstacles, uh, including Bill Gates personally calling the head of Apache and trying to recruit him, trying to pull the rug from un underneath us. Um, and I'm happy, to, I'm happy to report that today Apache is the widest used web server ever. And out of the 200 programmers, um, only two left. The rest of them wholeheartedly support Apache. And um, we paved the way for the open source software like Linux, like uh, Eclipse, uh, because of that. Now, looking back, I have a lot of scars. Right? You, you can't win the battle without getting hurt. Will, will I do it again? Would I do it again? Absolutely, because it's a lot of fun. Right? Of course, you take chances, you, there's going to be setbacks. 
And to handle setbacks, I would encourage you to watch this movie, Cut the Company Man. Uh, it's got the Ben Affleck, Chris Cooper, and Tommy Lee Jones in there. It's Hollywood, but it's really real, actually. And you just need to realize that it may not be your fault, but you need to be prepared. How, how are you going to be prepared? Keep your resume updated all the time. Right? <laughs> I got it. And instead of updating your resume when, when you need it, whenever you do something good, update it. And also keep your network active. If you're not finding a job, you can help other people to find a job. And realizing that even if you get fired, a change may be the best thing that could happen to you. So many people told me about that. Right? And with the time constraint, I'm going to skip a bunch of things. Uh, office politics, well, I'm going to keep talking until my time is up, and then we can have a discussion afterward, because this is fun. Um, it's not really necessarily bad. Um, it's a process, one of my mentors told me that it's a process of allocating resources. Okay? And promotion is one kind of uh, resource that you allocate to. You often have no, cho no choice whether you play or not, because that is the necessary part of getting the job done. Get the resource for your team so that they can get the job done. Okay? So you want to try to understand the power structure and the connections inside the company. And for the beginners, uh, because it's played through people, let's study Dale Carnegie. For defensive measure, let's read Mucky Valley. <laughs> for advanced study, study Sun Tzu. Okay? And it's mostly, uh, it's most effectively learned by mentoring. And you want to have a mentor that's outside of your organization, that's relatively senior. Uh, you, you pretty much have to look for it. And uh, when you have a chance in big companies, when you have a chance to kind of shadow senior executives, they, some, some, many of them have this program, jump on it. And uh, put your kind of a, a zoom lenses on, uh, you're going to learn a lot. Finance, most technical people don't know, don't, can't, can't read the uh, financial statement of a company. That's, not, that's bad. Um, and and there's, there's a lot of lost opportunities there. Not going to go into that. Uh, here's my list of the characteristics of a good leader. Okay. And I'm just going to leave it there and uh, people can look at it. I'm, I'm not going into it. Um, the key question is how do you develop into a good leader? There are three things I want to mention. One is that I want to seek tough challenge. Whenever there's a choice between taking on this project or that project, take the hard one. Take the one that people don't think you're going to be able to pull it off. Because if you do pull it off, you're OK. If you don't pull it off, they expect you to fail anyway. <laughs> Second, sharpen your judgment. Not with your own success or failure, but with other people's. Whenever you, look, you know, work in an environment, look at your manager, look at your manager's manager, look at your company CEO. They're faced with a, with a lot of decisions. What would you do in their shoes, and why? And what did they do, and what's, what's the result? Learn it, and, and, and then you can reuse it later on in your own situation. Finally, what I believe is the most important habit of the highly effective people is this. We, yeah, we were taught to categorize our um, things to do in two axes. One is how urgent, is it urgent or not urgent? Important or not important? Most people without thinking would say that, hey, I want to spend most of my time on urgent and important things, right? What I realize is that most, most successful and effective people, they spend most of their time on the important but non-urgent things, okay? Why? There are three reasons. First is that if you get rid of a lot of important things, you don't have a lot of urgent and important things left. Second is that it actually leaves you bandwidth to deal with what, it, what, you know, pardon my language, um, probably can't use that with, with children, but uh, when, when certain things hit the fan, uh, you, you gotta deal with it in the real world, okay? Third thing is that that leaves you time to think ahead. Have a vision to start a new initiative to create something, okay? And finally, the most important thing is to learn. And uh, I have some helpful resources in my presentation, not gonna go through that. Um, I, would, I like to encourage people to learn every day in your life. Read not just the technical journals, read widely. And, and I, I'll thank John for that. Second is uh, ask all around for feedback, especially you're the boss. And do something that's outside of your technical field. I learned to play golf. 
when I was in, in my 40s. And I met a lot of friends, and I learned a lot uh, from, uh, from playing golf. And um, look for opportunities to learn formally and informally. For example, in company, you've got company training. You can go to conferences. And when you're a senior, you go to executive uh, education in a various school. And when you get a chance to sit among experts like today, ask questions. Ask them you know, and learn from them. And finally, teach. That's the deepest learning that I ever, ever experienced is when I was teaching something. So I think uh, I'm good, right? Thank you. All right.